Bien, bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs, chers collègues. Je suis Francesco Panese, je suis vice-doyen de la faculté des sciences sociales et politiques. Et c'est avec plaisir que j'ai accepté l'invitation à vous adresser quelques mots de, de bienvenue. Je sais que vous n'êtes pas seulement de l'Université de Lausanne, pas seulement de la faculté des sciences sociales et politiques. Mais pour notre faculté, c'est important ce soir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue. Pourquoi Parce que vous vous adressez, vous allez adresser dans les prochains jours, en tout cas dans les deux, les, les panels, ce soir et les panels qui vont suivre, eh bien, cette thématique extrêmement importante de la décolonisation des institutions culturelles. Et je dois dire que c'est une thématique qui me tient aussi à cœur, personnellement. Il se trouve que j'ai dirigé un petit musée pendant une quinzaine d'années. Et je me rappelle très bien le 11 septembre 2001, alors que tout le monde se souvient de ce qu'il faisait le 11 septembre 2001. Eh bien, nous, nous étions en train d'organiser une discussion sur la biopiraterie, une forme de colonialisme très contemporain qui consistait pour l'Occident à aller piller des connaissances biologiques dans les pays dits en voie de développement. Et à cette époque-là, on se rendait déjà compte, mais vous, vous y avez travaillé, il y a des chercheurs qui sont réunis dans ce colloque qui ont travaillé, on se rend compte que la question du colonialisme et l'enjeu de la décolonisation croise, est au croisement de différents enjeux précisément scientifiques, moraux et politiques. Et je crois que lorsqu'on s'attache à des enjeux qui sont au croisement des sciences de la morale et du politique, eh bien, les chercheurs font ce que l'on appelle des sciences publiques, c'est-à-dire des sciences qui sont mises dans l'espace public de manière à susciter le débat, à donner lieu à des appropriations, des savoirs mis au service d'acteurs institutionnels, associatifs, militants ou politiques, des savoirs qui permettent de contribuer à leur réflexion en vue de l'action, en vue de décision, en vue d'intervention, en vue de mobilisation. Et évidemment, vous avez toutes et tous un air de parenté avec ce que l'on fait des, dans les musées, puisque euh, vous êtes là pour souligner l'importance qu'il y a à souligner, à reconnaître et aussi à problématiser le rôle des musées comme institution publique, comme institution pour le public. Un jour, on m'a demandé ce que j'essayais de faire dans les quelques expositions que j'ai faites avec mon équipe à l'époque, et j'avais répondu, nous tentons d'exposer des savoirs, de fabriquer du sens et de toucher des sensibilités. Et pour cela, les personnes de musée, les professionnels de musée le savent bien, nous avons des outils pour cela. Ces outils, ce sont des objets, des documents que nous, instruons, que nous instituons par l'acte muséal lui-même comme des sémiophores, pour reprendre la très fameuse notion développée par Christophe Pomian. Ces sémiophores, comme les amphores transportent de l'eau, les sémiophores sont des porteurs de signes qui, dans le contexte muséal, comme dans l'espace public où il y a parfois des statues de personnages contestables, eh bien, se mettent à signifier de manière spécifique et parfois de manière politique. Et je crois que vous allez discuter ce soir et aussi dans, les, dans le colloque eh bien, de la force de ces sémiophores dans la manière dont il façonne les convictions. Ces sémiophores participent de l'exotisation qui produit de l'étrangeté. Ces sémiophores participent de l'altérisation qui institue des personnes comme fondamentalement différentes, au point parfois de déclencher des réactions émotionnelles instinctives envers les membres d'une communauté, ce qui aboutit à la conflictualisation. Vous voyez, il y a beaucoup de yon ce soir dans ma bouche. Et donc l'altérisation, c'est aussi rabaisser et isoler un groupe ou plusieurs, et ainsi de rendre possible la discrimination, la violence ou la persécution à l'égard de ce groupe, de cette communauté, de cette société. Et les personnes qui ont travaillé dans les musées et qui ont eu l'occasion d'exposer des œuvres d'ailleurs, eh bien, on doivent être attentifs, c'est en tout cas mon avis, à faire en sorte que les musées actuels ne soient pas comme les musées coloniaux, des technologies d'avilissement, pour reprendre le terme utilisé par le philosophe que j'apprécie beaucoup, Grégoire Chamaillou. Et aussi, lorsqu'on met en scène des objets qui viennent ailleurs, d'ailleurs, il est important de réfléchir au fait que les dispositifs scénographiques ne doivent pas devenir des dispositifs d'avilissement de celles et ceux que l'on montre à travers leur production culturelle, rituelle euh, ou historique. Et en vous confrontant au passé, 
pour reprendre le titre de cette très belle rencontre, je crois que vous allez, vous, j'ai vu le programme, vous mettez en lumière certaines de ces technologies et ces dispositifs d'avilissement. Et c'est une, une cause, une, 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 une raison pour laquelle il est très important à mes yeux et sans doute à, à celle aux yeux de, de ma faculté de vous dire simplement merci d'avoir abordé ce thème, de l'aborder dans vos travaux et d'agir pour que la situation de la colonisation puisse enfin appartenir au passé. Je vous remercie. Bonjour, mon nom est Thomas Navid et je suis professeur d'histoire internationale à l'Université de Lausanne. Alors, quand il y a 30 ans, nous avons publié avec Bouddha et Théman, qui était professeur. Ah, vous m'entendez Alors, je recommence depuis le début Alors, mon nom est Thomas David et euh, je suis professeur d'histoire internationale à l'Université de Lausanne. Et je disais que quand il y a 30 ans, nous avons euh, publié avec Bouddha et Théman, qui était alors professeur d'histoire à l'Université de Genève et l'Université de Lausanne, nos premières recherches sur l'impérialisme suisse et sur la place de la Suisse dans le processus de colonisation, je mentirais si je disais que nos travaux ont eu beaucoup de succès. À part mes parents, je pense que personne n'a dû lire mes articles, et il m'est arrivé dans des colloques de présenter mes travaux devant trois personnes, et la moitié s'était trompée de salle. Donc voilà. Alors, ce désintérêt est sans doute lié à la qualité de mes travaux, mais s'expliquait aussi par le contexte euh, historiographique. Parce que jusque dans les années 1990, euh, l'histoire de la Suisse est écrite en se focalisant sur la nation, en se limitant aux frontières du territoire helvétique. Et c'est uniquement durant le dernier quart du XXe siècle que certains historiens et certaines historiennes ont commencé à intégrer la Suisse dans une perspective européenne. Mais, vraiment, juste dans les années 2000, on peut dire que les territoires en dehors de l'espace européen n'étaient que très rarement mentionnés dans les livres d'histoire sur la Suisse. Et l'argument était toujours le même. Le pays n'avait pas eu de colonie, ça avait donc guère de sens de s'intéresser aux liens de la Suisse avec ces régions. Les choses ont commencé à changer lentement au tour de, tournant du siècle et pour plusieurs raisons. Alors, je ne vais pas être trop long, je vais en mentionner juste une. Les recherches de la commission Bergier sur la, le rôle de la Suisse dans la Deuxième Guerre mondiale ont mis à mal la neutralité helvétique et ont mis, ont mis en évidence la collaboration d'une partie des élites politiques et économiques suisses avec le régime nazi. Et les chercheuses et les chercheurs ont commencé à s'intéresser à d'autres mythes de l'histoire suisse, en particulier l'absence de passé colonial de la Suisse. Et lorsqu'en 2005, nous avons publié avec Bouddha et Temat et Yannick Chaufeldou l'ouvrage « La Suisse et l'esclavage des Noirs », nous avons senti ce changement. Le livre a été un succès, les gens étaient intrigués par, le, par la thématique et au même moment, Hans Fessler publiait son ouvrage « Une Suisse esclavagiste voyage dans un pays au-dessus de tout soupçon » et des recherches étaient aussi menées sur les relations de la Suisse avec euh, l'Afrique du Sud durant l'apartheid. Mais, même en 2005, il y avait encore beaucoup de réticences. Par exemple, on nous, on nous disait que ce n'était pas la Suisse, mais quelques citoyens isolés qui avaient participé à la traite. Beaucoup continuaient à répéter que ben, la Suisse n'avait pas de passé colonial et... Mais il y avait eu un changement historiographique que le mouvement Black Lives Matter a accéléré ces dernières années. Et les travaux sur le rôle de la Suisse dans le processus de colonisation et de décolonisation ont commencé à être plus nombreux, menés par certaines des personnes qui se trouvent dans cette salle. Et ces recherches ont montré, et c'est là un point important, que ces aventures lointaines n'étaient pas anecdotiques, n'étaient pas exotiques, mais avaient eu des répercussions économiques social, politique, culturel, en Suisse même. Et on commence désormais à admettre que l'histoire de la Confédération helvétique ne peut se comprendre sans adopter une perspective globale. Et d'ailleurs, la Société suisse d'histoire économique et sociale est en train de lancer un projet d'histoire mondiale de la Suisse. Surtout, et j'aimerais vraiment, et c'est le point le plus important à mes yeux, cette thématique de la Suisse coloniale a été reprise en dehors de l'université. Comme on va en discuter aujourd'hui et demain, les musées, les artistes, mais aussi des réalisatrices et réalisateurs de films se sont emparés de cette question. Les autorités politiques, au niveau cantonal, on peut le voir à Genève, ou au niveau de la Confédération, sont désormais sensibles à cette question. Et cette thématique commence à être abordée dans les écoles, comme j'ai pu le voir avec mes enfants. 
Et des associations aussi se penchent sur cette question en organisant, par exemple, des promenades dans les grandes villes autour du colonialisme et de l'esclavage. Bon, comme on le verra lors des discussions aujourd'hui et demain, il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire. Mais le passé colonial de la Suisse et ses répercussions contemporaines est désormais une thématique ouvertement débattue dans l'espace public et qui a gagné en légitimité. Alors, pour beaucoup de personnes qui sont présentes dans cette salle, ça tombe sous le sens que l'on organise aujourd'hui dans cette salle, devant une foule nombreuse, un colloque intitulé « Décoloniser les musées ». Mais je peux vous dire que, quand j'ai commencé mes travaux il y a 30 ans, ce projet n'était même pas de l'ordre de l'imaginaire. Ce colloque a été rendu possible par la coloration et le soutien d'un certain nombre d'institutions, la Faculté des sciences politiques, et je remercie euh, son vice-doyen, le professeur Franco Parnese, et un autre vice-doyen, Jean-Christophe Grac, qui est présent dans la salle. Je remercie aussi l'Institut d'études politiques en particulier et son directeur, le professeur André Mack, qui ont soutenu financièrement ce projet. Il en est de même du Centre d'histoire internationale et d'études politiques de la mondialisation, le CRIM à la faculté des SSP, qui est un centre de compétences interdisciplinaires sur les thématiques de la coalition, des coalitions, des rapports nord-sud et de la question de race. Nous aimerions aussi remercier le Fonds national suisse pour son soutien. Notre gratitude va aussi à Lionel Pernet, qui est ici présent, le directeur du Musée cantonal d'archéologie et d'histoire à Lausanne, de nous accueillir dans ses murs. Et j'aimerais aussi remercier Guillaume Bossir, Charlotte Roy, Léa Boldo et surtout, et surtout, où elle est Aline, où est Aline Aline Martello, pour leur aide durant toutes les étapes de la présentation de ce colloque. Merci, j'étais un peu long et je passe maintenant la parole à Bernard Chef. Merci beaucoup. Ja, vielen Dank. Und schätze dann Sommer, ja auch ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen. No, I'm kidding. This is what the conference if it would have been conceivable at all, as Thomas Davi just has pointed out, if such a conference would have taken place 15 or 20 years ago, maybe this what it would, it would have sounded like this, French, German, possibly also some Italian, but times are changing, so also now we uh, today and tomorrow in this conference are uh, in the midst of one of the great uh, paradoxes of our post-colonial moment, namely trying to organize discussions on how to possibly overcome or at least transform some of Europeans' imperial legacies by making use of the language of uh, some of the greatest European imperial powers in modern history, namely the British Empire and the American Empire. This is a paradox that we are all facing. We also don't know how to uh, overcome it here in Switzerland. I'm just pointing it out that I'd li really like to emphasize that it is precisely in the spirit of historical awareness, historical learning, but also compassion and cosmopolitanism that, of course, it is totally okay. Uh, we would appreciate if you also in the audience and the participants could make yourself understood in English, but it's absolutely okay to also use any other language at your disposal because uh, if one thing is uh, short and there is and more than enough uh, linguistic expertise present in this room uh, and will speak tomorrow. So my name is Ben Harchar. I am a research professor here at the University of Lausanne. I just started here recently. Uh, in January, and I'm building a research group uh, that aims to kind of, uh, as Tom had already pointed out, I'm kind of following on the footstep, uh, in the footsteps of uh, what the work that he did and many other people did here in Lausanne. So we're trying to re, uh, retell the story of Switzerland in the 19th century, and by doing so, maybe also giving at least some hints how also, by looking at the case of Switzerland, we can also find some new insights into the history of European imperialism more generally. Because uh, in uh, Thomas being the modest colleague that he is, he uh, was right to uh, say that this, the work that he did was extremely important to transform the Swiss national narrative, but it was more than only that. Because uh, his work and the other work that was done, which showed this very strange but remarkable continuous presence of Swiss capital investments of soldiers, mercenaries, plantation owners, etc. and so forth, in virtually all of the European empires also, I think, uh, played a significant role 
in what now among historians is often also uh, discussed as trans-imperial history. So uh, it's trying to understand how the history of European imperialism is not only a story of undeniable competition, violent competition, of course, among these different European empires, but to a certain degree also a, uh, a story of uh, border crossing collaboration of kind of social and economic and cultural integration through mutual European expansion. And uh, to make this maybe, and this is basically the explanation that Switzerland integrated into this imperial world because indeed the large European empires, they were open to all kinds of people from Switzerland looking for opportunities, but also from other regions that we usually don't consider to be prime examples of European imperialism, not moving in Eastern European regions or Scandinavian regions. So uh, to make this a little bit more concrete, I mean, what this actually means, I would invite you to have a look at these uh, magnificent paintings in the auditorium here, because indeed uh, the post-colonial critique that we have been learning from for the last few years, of course, doesn't only challenge the national narratives and also the Swiss national narratives, but I would say most, if not all, uh, categories of what it means to be uh, European. So this, these paintings, they were actually uh, finished, uh, uh, they were done almost 100 years ago in 1923 by uh, a local artist from here, from this region, Louis Rivier, uh, obviously inspired by the Sixteen Chapel in the Vatican uh, State, who tried to mirror the Renaissance style of this building, the architecture. And uh, his paintings depicted uh, some of the central categories of uh, European uh, civilization at the time. So you see the sciences on this side, you see the arts. Uh, on the other side, you see education, knowledge, and of course, you also see the story of religion, namely of uh, Christianity, hence uh, core markers of Europe's imperial identity that emerged during this whole uh, history of empire and with which uh, European uh, uh, cultures also claimed a superiority, of course, superiority vis-a-vis uh, -vis supposedly less uh, civilized uh, uh, societies. Today, almost 100 years later, uh, we are now learning that uh, the stories behind these categories uh, can no longer be told, uh, firstly, without acknowledging also the expertise, the labor, but also the suffering that went into these stories from non-European uh, societies that are actually crucial for histories of science, of the arts, of knowledge, of Christianity also. Secondly, uh, I think we also are growing aware that we have to tell these stories in a different fashion. We cannot uh, tell them anymore without uh, also pointing to the fact that these categories are also outcomes or heavily shaped by histories of violence, of the transatlantic uh, slave trade, of the exploitation of non-European labor, but also knowledge and expertise, and very often also violent destruction of non-European societies and cultures. So simply put, yeah, the question that we are facing here in Europe and beyond already for many years is the question in our title. Are we really ready for this path? And by this path, we mean this path indeed that we have uh, for quite a long time uh, tended to ignore, if not uh, suppress. Um, for many of us also here and elsewhere, uh, it's of course uh, long, long overdue to uh, kind of have a different look at uh, our shared imperial uh, past. For others among us, uh, this might also involve some certain degrees of anxieties, of insecurities. After all, we know, all know it is difficult to unlearn long cherished notions and ideas of the world uh, how to, what it means to be European in a uh, post colonial world. So we at the Center of International History and Political Studies of Globalization believe that this process of learning and unlearning our imperial histories um, is inevitable and it is also necessary to build a more inclusive and democratic futures. And I'm saying this in full awareness uh, that it might sound a bit uh, ironic after all, all the violence that is going on presently as I speak uh, in different parts of the world. I think we still need to kind of and, and, and hold on to these to these ideals, um, but we are also uh, quite uh, aware that uh, launches at the conference um, is necessary, but it is not uh, particularly uh, original. It has been a debate that has been has been cooking for a long time. Actually, also already here, uh, I'd like to just uh, 
some of you might have seen it, there was a wonderful exhibition actually also here in this museum a few years ago uh, called The Exotic, and uh, we are very happy to have two of the uh, organizers of that uh, um, um, exhibition uh, speaking to us uh, tomorrow, Claire Prison and uh, Noemi Etienne. So, activists, artists, scholars, uh, often, one has to say, on the margins of our institutions have been doing this work for quite a long time already. They have been pushing for change for a long time with outside of institutions, sometimes in collaboration with institutions, oftentimes also against these institutions, and oftentimes if necessary also on the streets. So what is our contribution then, uh, you might ask? Well, what we uh, like to do is, uh, or what we believe is that, and I'm saying this in a very, very cautiously, that these calls for decolonization, I think to a certain degree at least, they have been heard now by various institutions, not only within academia, but also other ones, as Tom already uh, pointed out, but they raise very, very practical questions in our mind. What does it exactly mean to decolonize if you are a primary or secondary school teacher? If you are a journalist or work in the advertising industry, if you're an urban planner or a healthcare professional or a police officer, and I could go on with this. So our modest aim is therefore to provide kind of a platform for discussion and exchange, networking in Switzerland to also learn what has already been done, taking stock to kind of organize, curate discussion within Switzerland, which is a small but a complicated uh, country given the traditional and newer linguistic divisions that we have, cantonal uh, structures, etc., and so forth. But of course, we also hope to uh, kind of make bridges also beyond the borders um, of uh, uh, Switzerland. So therefore, it is our idea, it was, it was our idea to launch a series of conferences uh, with experts experts who work within these institutions, but also uh, people who work uh, outside uh, these institutions to practically discuss issues uh, at hand. And we decided to kick off this series with uh, the theme of uh, museums, which is a very, very topical one, as uh, Franco has already uh, pointed out. Uh, and before I uh, introduce now the moderators of this evening's uh, round uh, table uh, to you, I have still one announcement uh, to make. Um, we uh, regret, we have regrettably, one of the uh, in, in invited experts for this evening's uh, round table. He had to cancel last minute. He wasn't able to come here to Lausanne. Ibu Kulibali Diop uh, from Berlin, who is playing an extremely important role now for several years already on uh, the theme of decolonization in, of museums in Berlin and Germany more broadly. Uh, due to an illness in his family, he was also not available over Zoom uh, this evening. Of course, we regret his absence tonight, but we wish him and his family very well and uh, speedy recovery, and we are sure there will be other opportunities to uh, invite him uh, in other venues. So let me now advance to uh, uh, introducing our uh, uh, moderators for this evening's uh, roundtable. I am very excited, and very happy, and very thankful to both of you, an old friend and a new friend. Let me start with my old friend, <laughs> Rohit Jain. Uh, we studied together at the University of Bern many years ago. Rohit is a uh, trained social anthropologist with a PhD from the University of Zurich, and a very important book on second generation migrants from India and Switzerland, and it was important and groundbreaking because it helped also in Switzerland to re, kind of re-examine the story or the, the phenomen phenomenon of migration, which was the, uh, discussed mostly in sort of intra-European perspectives for a long time. Uh, Rohit book really uh, played a very important role to open up this perspective and to become aware that migration also in Switzerland is a phenomenon which has also uh, colonial uh, uh, roots and post-colonial legacies. Uh, Roy has many other things too. He's an artist, researcher, anti-racism activist in many extremely important uh, initiatives in Switzerland, too numerous to uh, name all of them in the German-speaking part of Switzerland, uh, mostly, but also recently uh, in Germany. So I'm just going to mention uh, a few things. Um, he uh, was uh, co-inventor, co-initiator of an anti-racist humor festival in Zurich a few years ago, uh, which uh, kind of taught us that the humor, such as stand-up comedy in Swiss television, for example, is far less innocent that uh, many of us had thought for a long time, but also thinking about how laughing and humor 
can be a very, very important and empowering tool also for anti-racist uh, critique. Um, he is also the, uh, one of the co-founders of the Institute New Switzerland, which is a think and act tank that influences discourses uh, and increasingly also policies and practices, I might add, uh, with regards to migration and anti-racism in Switzerland. And he's also the co-founder of the Community Arts Center Living Room uh, in Bern. So, Rohit, um, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and uh, coming here today. Then my new friend, Stefanie Zinalski, uh, with uh, Toma and others, uh, she was extremely important in welcoming me here in, uh, in Lausanne as a newcomer. Stephanie is a uh, lecturer at the University of uh, Lausanne, uh, specializes in economic and social history of the 19th and 20th centuries, in particular, the history of capitalism with a focus on social elites, but also from feminist and gender perspectives, and from those two perspectives have produced extremely important work, for instance, on uh, the history of philanthropy in Switzerland, the recruiting practices of uh, international firms, gender inequalities among uh, Swiss financial, econ economic, and more recently also cultural art, uh, elites from the art world in these global and transnational perspectives. Thank you also to you, Stephanie, uh, for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, coming here today. So, without further ado, I'll hand over the microphone to Roy, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Bernhard and uh, Omar for the invitation. We're very honored, Stephanie and me, to uh, facilitate the debate with uh, such a great and uh, round of renowned uh, experts and inspiring uh, experts. And we had already the opportunity to uh, prepare the session of, uh, of tonight. So um, it's uh, great to have uh, two hours and not only 45 minutes, for example, to really discuss uh, or start the discussion on decolonizing museums uh, at this conference. Um, we have uh, thought to uh, frame this uh, with, with two blocks. Like the first block uh, we thought is on uh, contexts and conditionalities. Some were already mentioned uh, by Bernhard and Poma, um, and some are already in this space. One is the question of disciplines. So uh, in Euro modernity, disciplines were there to discipline societies and knowledge and so on and change and transformation, uh, as you uh, said, especially in this context, is more relevant for this change, uh, interdisciplinarity, trans or post-disciplinarity might be very important. And I think this uh, question of like how uh, museums should be decolonized in Switzerland is a very transdisciplinary, has a trans, very transdisciplinary history. Same thing is about transnationalism. On the one hand, it's a, it's a, a question or an endeavor for, for nation states. On the other hand, we're talking about transnational entanglements. So how can we bring these, there's like this tension of the local and the global and the discipline and the, the society that we want to talk about in the first block. And the second block, again, is about the tension between the very practical solutions you want to find, strategies of curation, of, uh, of involving communities, uh, of representation, on the other hand, there is no practical solution without a vision. So how can we combine the, the practical solutions, the pragmatism with the, the vision and the strategic vision and political vision that we have? So uh, that's the, the program that we have. And uh, in between, uh, we'll have, uh, after the first block, uh, a short uh, slot for a discussion, short break, and then also again after the second block, um, a slot for discussion. So um, we only shortly introduce uh, our, uh, our guests and give them the opportunity to present themselves afterwards and their work and their stake or statement on why or what decolonization uh, uh, means for them. So we have on, uh, on the right of your, uh, it's like in a, in, a, in a boxing ring, you know, we have on the right. Stephanie Archangel, she is a curator at the Rijksmuseum in uh, Amsterdam. 
and she co-curated in 2020 the exhibition here, Black in Rembrandt's Time. Also, she worked um, as a curator on the exhibition on slavery, also in the Rijks Museum in 2021. So, applause for uh, Stephanie uh, Archangel. <laughs> Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for having me. Am I clear enough? I think so, right? Yeah. Um, my name is Stephanie Archangel, and I've been working at the Rijksmuseum for the past five years. And I think I've worked on two uh, exhibitions that um, touch upon the questions that we have today. Uh, one is Black and Remembrance Time, which was in 2020. Um, it was an exhibition uh, on which uh, the presence of uh, people of African descent in the 17th century uh, in um, the art of the Netherlands was researched. So um, we made an exhibition which didn't show the stereotypical way on which uh, people of color are being portrayed in that era, but we looked upon individualized paintings of people of African descent that were made from life. So not pushed into the back next to white sitters, uh, but front and centered, front and centered. And um, we are actually looking eye to eye um, at people who actually existed in that era. Um, the question of identification was extremely difficult, uh, but we still try to give them presence by looking in archives and looking at, for example, their marriage uh, uh, statements and their baptisms of their children, just as to give you a glimpse of the life that they led in that era, which was a life of being a free human being, as in the Netherlands, it has always been illegal to have slavery in the country itself, but it has been legal to do that in the colonies, which is almost a, a bridge <laughs> to the Rijksmuseum uh, exhibition that I worked on um, in 2021. Um, I think it was a difficult question when I think the director said that we are not making an economical exhibition, we are making one where you center the people that were enslaved themselves. I don't think he quite understood what he asked from us at that point, but later on, I think we were very, very glad that he asked this question because how do you tell the history of people that have been made into products and therefore have been prohibited to, um, to uh, collect and to read and write? Um, we answered this question by using oral history um, because um, we used songs that were brought from and given upon generations and generations which talk about slavery. Um, this is the first room when you enter the exhibition. Um, we also made sure that it was, uh, the medium was kept intact as oral history. So you could also hear the songs um, and we used different songs from different countries. So what I'm showing you now is a song which is in my native language, uh, Papiamentu, which says, Katibu um, Tagalia Mama, which um, translates to, um, mother, uh, people are like chickens. Mother, they are selling us like chickens. Um, I think it was the first time, and I should have known this, but I didn't know why I didn't know this, but it was the first time I grasped the horribleness of the idea that it does not matter what people tell you uh, that you are. It does not matter how people treat you. Um, this feeling of injustice is carried upon us everywhere for centuries. Um, Thank you. So thank you very much, Stephanie. We are moving now to Ellen Berry Thompson. So again, I will shortly introduce before I give you the floor. So Ellen Berry Thompson is an art historian. Uh, she has been working as a curator uh, for 10 years at the Chateau de Prangin, which is uh, a part of the Swiss National Museums located in, uh, in the French speaking part of Switzerland. And then in 2016, she became the director of the Musée de Prangin. 
And in this context, she has set up an important exhibition uh, called Les Indiennes en tissu à la conquête du monde. And yeah, she will tell you more about this just now. So thank you very much for being here today with us. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so as Stephanie said, I'm an art historian working in a museum of history. I'm not a specialist on decolonization, but I became familiar um, with it by um, curating two exhibitions on the subject of chins, which is a type of um, cotton textile. And I suddenly became very familiar with a complex and sensitive subject which from the Swiss point of view um, has both local and global implications. On the one hand, chintzes are one of the Switzerland's great uh, success stories. Um, in the 18th century, the cotton industry was one of the chief drivers of the economy and printing cotton fabrics provided a living uh, for entire regions of the country. And on the other hand, uh, the chintz industry and the textile trade placed the country at the heart of the European and global economy. So to understand these implications, I would just like us to look at one example. You see it now. This is a letter written by a Geneva textile merchant to a merchant in Bordeaux named Raymond. Bordeaux is, uh, not, uh, uh, is important because it became involved in the colonial trade already in the 17th century with the sugar and then in the slave trade and textiles. And attached to the letter, you see uh, two pieces of blue and red red striped cotton um, cloth of Indian origin. Now, brightly colored fabrics with checks or stripes were highly prized in Africa, but also in the Americas, where they were used to clothe um, indigenous people, but also captives, as illustrated um, watercolor, as are illustrated by watercolors by Jean-Baptiste Debray. Uh, in this work, showing slave labor in a sugar mill in Rio de Janeiro, one of the enslaved workers wears trousers cut from a fabric very similar to the one offered by the Geneva trader to his Bordeaux colleague. So here we have a trader in Geneva importing fabrics from India to sell in Bordeaux from where they were probably sent on to the Americas to be used as clothing for African slaves. But in our exhibition, we also have other examples. Merchants in Basel setting up in Nantes to better fund cargoes for the slave trade. Officers from Neuchâtel in the service of the powerful Dutch East India Company. Swiss plantation owners or managers making use of slave labor. So an exhibition on chintz is really an opportunity to interweave local and global history and to consider Switzerland's links to the wider world. It sheds light on the involvement of many Swiss people in key chapters of the modern period. But how do you tell this fascinating yet extraordinarily complex saga without falling into the trap of a neo-colonial Euro-centered type of storytelling? So when we decided to put on a show about chintz and cotton textiles, many questions arose. How should we view these objects? What to bring to light? What to keep in the shadows? how to revisit the collections in the light of new social imperatives, and finally, how can we tell a story for which there are sometimes few or no surviving objects? So throughout the conceptual phase, we concentrated on which story we were going to tell on and who was going to tell it. Um, so the first important, is, is it too long now? Because you did say five minutes. It's all right, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, for us, the first important step was to refuse to do a history of art type of exhibition where what would only concentrate on fabrics, techniques, patterns, and motifs. Uh, lots of chintz uh, exhibitions in the past were done this way. Um, we decided to really focus on the role that Swiss people played in this global story. And thirdly, one of our main aims was to combat the idea that Switzerland had no colonial past and no, uh, had no colonies, on the pretext that it had no colonies. And then once the guidelines of our discourse were established, it was a matter of finding credible partners to carry and develop certain contents in the exhibition. And here again, in order to avoid Eurocentrism, we decided to invite narrators from various backgrounds and various parts of the world 
and not only university professors, but also independent researchers, museum colleagues, and descendants of manufacturers. One of our great experiences was to invite a colleague from Dakar in Senegal to come to Switzerland and help us develop the contents of a part of our exhibition focusing on textiles used in Africa. And not only did he give us access to new literature and collections, but he also brought a welcome non-Western perspective to our whole exhibition concept. And he also gave us the possibility to display a fabric that is typical of what was being made in Africa at the time of the slave trade. So to summarize, in the case of this exhibition, and to me, decolonizing meant, amongst other things, facing up to a disturbing chapter of Swiss history and a not very well known one in the wider public, adopting a global and interdisciplinary approach and combining cultural history, economic history and art history, varying perspectives and engaging with people around the world, taking into account feedback from the public, very important, making research carried out by historians easily understandable and av available to the large public, and looking at our collections in a new way. And we hope that this exhibition contributes to a new, way, new view of the involvement of Swiss people in the history of chins, but also the triangular trade and the slave trade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, for the second position and perspective. And uh, it's all getting more and more interesting, and I'm looking forward to the next uh, introductions. Uh, next will be by uh, Siraj Rasul, who is a senior professor of history at the University of uh, the Western Cap uh, in South Africa. He's a researcher, a curator, and a consultant in the field of heritage, memory, politics, and museology. And uh, you have done so many different projects and like uh, curatorial projects, research projects, and also consultancy. It's difficult to name all of them. One is like you chaired the scientific committee of the International Council of African Museums, and you are at the moment, uh, a consultant for the for different projects, uh, the German government or museums and in Austria. One book um, I want to mention is like you co-edited the highly acclaimed um, book of uh, Unsettled Histories, Making uh, South Africa, uh, South African public uh, pasts. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the organizers and um, all of the partners uh, of this conference. Um, yeah, I come from Cape Town, uh, University of the Western Cape, being deeply immersed in projects of museum transformation in South Africa, uh, making new museums, new museologies, such as District 6 Museum. But also, how do you remake um, old national collections that are the product of a colonial history in all of the ways that we uh, define colonialism, and you turn those into collections of the new nation. Uh, that has been a very important project of, in a sense, decolonizing uh, the National Museum in particular. Um, one of the important projects that I did is I wrote a book uh, many, many years ago on the history of human remains collecting in South Africa that made an argument that the dead Khoisan body illegally disinterred from, uh, from, its, from graves uh, was at the heart of the formation of the modern museum in South Africa. And along the way, uh, we also discovered that a Swiss um, anthropologist, Rudolf Perch, was in the field in Southern Africa at the beginning of the 20th century, at the very time that South Africa was becoming a nation. And so the, the right claimed by this anthropologist with support from the, uh, the Cape government, support from the German government, uh, the right of this scholar, so-called scholar, to assemble all of these collections and especially to illegally uh, 
disinter human remains was the subject of a, a police inquiry. And that police inquiry happened precisely at a time of what a number of us have called the South Africanization of science. And when the South African nation, the new white nation of South Africa was laying a, a prior claim to these human remains as part of what uh, my colleagues and I have de described as the fossil complex as marking the peculiar nature of colonialism in a settler society such as South Africa. And that work on restitution led to a restitution in 2012 of the remains of Klaas and Troy Pinar, uh, whose bodies had been disinterred, broken at the knees, forced into a barrel of salt, transported to Hamburg and then to Vienna, um, along with material culture and all kinds of other collections. And so what emerged from that was an opportunity to think about what colonialism was supposedly in a society that didn't have African colonies, but also to think about the various meanings of colonialism. And one of the foremost meanings that we have insisted upon, that this has to do with disciplines. And this is a, a, a set of issues that I've gone on to discuss very widely in Germany, in different ethnographic museums, different conferences, different settings where I advise a number of different parties, where I'm on the advisory board of the Lushan uh, collection in Berlin, of the Ecker collection in, uh, in Leipzig, where in Germany today, it is very clear, nobody will, will, has any doubt that there is no place any longer for human remains from taken from what the Germans call colonial context. And a set of policies have emerged, practices have emerged of a very clear a return of human remains will happen. But what has happened in that museum history is a, is a separation of what the Germans call anthropologie and what they call ethnologie. And today we have an association of violence with anthropologie, but an association of care with ethnologie. And we have argued that to make the separation between these collections that have been divided into different disciplines and into different museums is an inadequate move. And this is, this is a problem that we face, one of the major problems that we face in the debate today, where we are on the threshold of returning 1,000 skulls from Rwanda, from Berlin, back to where they come from, arising out of the collection history of a scholar by the name of Chekhanovsky, but who at the same time, like Rudolf Perch, was also making sound recordings, collecting art, collecting material culture. And what I'm arguing to you is we need to make an associate, the very same association of violence with what we call the collections of ethnology. Just finally, my project, as it is in South Africa and as it is in Europe, is an anti-ethnographic museum project. The ethnographic museum is a project of colonial violence. It would not be possible in a democratic society like South Africa today to have these collections divided between native people, indigenous people on the one hand, and European descent people who produce a narrative of civilization that begins in Rome and Greece, that passes through London, and that culminates in Cape Town. That that, that that classificatory division is in the process of being demolished. And so when we talk about restitution and decolonization, we need to talk about these epistemic matters. There's one term 
That is a deeply colonial term that has already been used in this room this afternoon. And that is the idea of the non-European collections. You know a new museum has been made in Berlin devoted to the non-European collections. South African history and the, the, the intellectual history of black consciousness and Stephen Bantu Biko will tell you about the inadequacies and the, the racism of that term, non-European. So we have work to do, and this meeting is very important for us to discuss these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Suraj. Can you get two three sentences on the image that is like uh, in, what, in the space? What we have here, my apologies, is we have an incredible, an incredibly powerful moment in the front room of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, in which um, uh, Pietrus Faulboy conducted a cultural ceremony in front of these two museum boxes, which contained the remains of Klaas and Troy Pinar, and which the Academy had already offered the South Africans to be returned in the museum boxes. However, what the South African delegation did in that, those negotiations was to introduce into the restitution field the concept of rehumanization. And so the returns of these remains took place through cultural ceremony, but also took place in coffins, as if they had been people who had been killed on the streets of Austria that week. Because these were the, the, this was the return of human beings who had been denied humanity in life and who had been denied humanity through the racism of the museum. Thank you very much, uh, Siraj. So we are moving now to our last uh, participant. So as uh, Bernard already told you, unfortunately, Ibu Koulibaly Diop uh, couldn't make it tonight. So we, we have four uh, speakers. So Pierre Sangaravelu uh, is a historian specializing in uh, colonial empires and uh, globalization. He's a professor at Paris Sorbonne and also London King's College. And he has done many, many uh, publications, but also documentaries. Uh, through which he highlights the interaction between uh, colonial empires and also the role played by the colonized. So colonized people not only as passive agents, as uh, historiography has showed them for a very long time, but also as agents, as, uh, as we could say. And since a few years ago, he collaborates with the Musée d'Orsay in Paris in order to show how the history uh, of the museum's artwork should be understood in a much more global and transnational uh, perspective. And I guess you will tell us a little bit more about uh, this. So thank you also for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, I, I worked for two decades on, on French colonialism and especially on how um, the, the European expansion was one of the main uh, vectors of globalization, social and cultural globalization during the 19th and the 20th century. And uh, that's right, seven years ago, I began to work with various uh, museums, first in France, then in, in, in Asia, and more recently in the US. And in fact, it was like an epiphany for me, a uh, 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 sort of rebirth, because at this time in 2015, museums and, and public institutions were beginning to ask the question of colonial legacy and how to deal with it and how to decolonize museums, etc. So the answer to this question uh, obviously depends on the definition of the term decolonization. And the very meaning of decolonizing is being, as you know, very hotly debated. So to be honest with you, and at the risk of, of disappointing you, uh, I, found, I found that this, um, this word and this concept of decolonization uh, are deceptive. Deceptive because this concept of decolonization gives the impression that Europe suddenly decided uni unilaterally to emancipate 
the natives, the natives who would have been passive uh, uh, in this process. That is why, in fact, the colonized people uh, do not call this process decolonization. Uh, 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 they, 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 they prefer to, to talk about liberation, of course, or even revolution. So, um, moreover, this idea of decolonization supposes that after experimenting with such a radical form of European domination, the so-called natives, the extra-European people, return to a hypothetical state of original purity. And that is a problem, because this idea of recovering a so-called purity, uh, original purity, can be, from a scientific point of view, very counterproductive and sometimes even politically dangerous. So decolonization as a concept uh, could be uh, an action and a practice where the Western world takes the lead. So in fact, as you know, uh, decolonizing is a, is a catch-all which includes a lot of practices and ideas. And I will try just to give you some example today um, from a program I'm currently directing at the Musée d'Orsay, which has inspired the first book published last October, which is entitled The Words of Orsay. And the initial idea was not so much to decolonize as to globalize the history of the works of art in the Musée d'Orsay. Musée d'Orsay, which is traditionally considered as the, the, musée, uh, the, the museum of the French genius uh, par excellence, that is to say, the Museum of the French Impressionist, etc. So, um, as you know, Orientalism, like, like uh, European colonial expansion, is very present in the collection of the Musée d'Orsay, and this has been perfectly documented and analyzed. Um, I think that we should not just focus exclusively on the Orientalist cliché, or stereotypes, it is advisable to show the ambiguity of many Western representations, such as this painting by Pierre Puvis de Chavannes, entitled uh, Black, uh, uh, Young Black Boy with Sword. And with this work, Puvis de Chavannes, who was at this time barely 20, 26 years old, uh, Puvis de Chavannes challenged aesthetic codes of the time. He dared to apply the conventions of the academic nude to a black man uh, with the classic studio pose. He dared to giving a, a sword and to, to have him sit uh, on a sumptuous clothes like a Renaissance aristocrat. So this was in um, 1850, so just two years after the abolition of slavery, uh, which occurred in, in 1848 in, in, in the, the French Empire. So the abolition provoked violent resistance from planters in the West Indies. And at this time, people of color were rendered invisible or depicted in a pejorative manner. And on the contrary, Previs de Chavannes, without escaping the Orientalist cliche of rom romanticism, in fact, Previs de, Sa de Chavannes portrays this young black boy as a master of his destiny. So moreover, uh, we, must, we must make visible the, the, the other forgotten protagonist in the traditional history of art. Let's talk about very sh shortly about this very famous painting by Manet, L'Olympia, of course. For a long time, no one paid attention to the young black woman standing next to the naked body of uh, Olympia. And people had almost forgotten that the name of this young woman was to be found in the archives and she lived in, in Paris uh, in the middle of the, the, the 19th century. Her name was Laure. And in fact, what is very interesting is, is that at this time, Manet didn't caricature this woman. He didn't sexualize uh, uh, Laure. Uh, uh, he, in fact, we have to, to understand the, 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 the process, the artistic process of Manet, we have to remember that in 1848, Manet, when he was only 16, uh, traveled in Brazil, and he was very outraged by the spectacle of a slave of slaves market uh, in Brazil. Uh, another example of forgotten protagonists are the foreign brokers like Ayashi Tadamasa. 
Uh, in the second half of the 19th century, uh, you all know that Japanese aesthetics transformed completely Western art. But it is not a simple European curiosity. We have forgotten, among others, the decisive role of this Japanese man, uh, Tadashi, uh, who imported in Paris almost 200,000 prints, thousands of Japanese paintings, etc. So Tadashi uh, supplied all the collectors of the capital of Paris, the, the Frères Goncourt, the Van Gogh brothers, Claude Monet, Degas, etc., etc. And Ayashi exerted a decisive influence in Europe by conveying a very idealized vision of Japan. A Japan depicted as the country of the samurai, the country of the geisha. So Ayashi at the same time popularized the impressionist, the French one, uh, in Japan at the very beginning of the 20th century. And these objects made, made by the French uh, uh, sculptor uh, uh, named Albert Bartholomé uh, uh, was made on the model of the mask of the traditional no theater, the Japanese theater. And this mask is very important because he reminds us that Orientalism, contrary to what Edouard Said wrote, Orientalism is not only an invention ex nihilo, but very often a co-production between Europeans and Asians in this case. So uh, finally, perhaps very quickly, the last, the last painting. Um, during this um, work at the Musée d'Orsay, we discovered that in the collection, we discovered the, the presence of many foreign artists who are not yet exhibited in the galleries. So more than 40 nationalities are represented at the Musée d'Orsay and more than 40% of the artists are not French. So this is not really a very French museum. Uh, for example, Orsay owns this painting uh, uh, by Henri Osawa Tanner, an African-American son of two former slaves. And, and, and Tanner is very famous nowadays in the US and he, he suffered uh, violent racist attacks for some of his peers in, in the, the academy in Pennsylvania. And to escape discrimination in the US, Tanner settled in Paris in 1891 and remained there, remained in France until his death in 1937. So in France, he enjoyed a fav favorable reception. He received the Legion d'honneur, etc. And his painting, intended to show that people from different origins and communities could, could live together. And in this painting, uh, entitled The Resurrection of Lazare, uh, made in, in, in 1896, he introduced a black figure in the center uh, uh, to show uh, that history and faith uh, uh, are common to all human beings and that, that everybody could live together without segregation. So, that's all for me uh, for this, this short introduction. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I think already your introductions show how you all uh, moved from one field to the other or one discipline to the other to produce all the knowledge and, and uh, representations you, uh, you showed to us. Um, so uh, I would say in Switzerland, uh, the, the debate on decolonizing uh, uh, museums or decolonization of post-colonial studies in the last 10 years was also not only uh, coming from the academia or like institutions, but also from, from activism or people from the margins who tried to bring in new stuff. So now we are here with historians, we are anthropologists, uh, people from the arts and activists really uh, trying to come together and that's great. Um, so I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Stephanie, um, how important, what, like in the, in the Dutch context, how important is this uh, cross or transdisciplinary uh, collaboration, or even if it's not only disciplines, but different fields come together? So how did this debate uh, develop in the, in the Dutch context? Um, I think it's, we are in the Netherlands at least at a point that, that we've realized that there's no way back, that, that we can't um, work uh, as disciplines 
without each other. Um, for example, um, in Black and Brown on Time, uh, we worked with people from art, with an art historical background, but I have a sociological background working on a historical uh, department. We worked with art historians. Um, and at the same time, I think it's also the concept of you can not be good at everything. That is impossible, especially when it comes to difficult fields like this. So um, if you are not good in archiving, get the best one in the field to do that properly for you and work together. Because um, it is only then that when all these disciplines come together that you can actually freely talk about something that has not been talked about before. So it's only it creates like a, a safe space of saying, okay, so what I've been researching turns to be true because the archives also shows that it's that way. And the, this art historical sense also shows it's, it's highly important. Uh, um, you, you can't do without, to be honest. Yeah. But I, I have a short follow up, but like institution or trainings are very often still organized uh, uh, along uh, disciplines. So how did this field emerge, you know, in, in, uh, or? I don't know if it, if it really emerged. I think, um, I think. How was it fought for? But my, difficult question. Okay, uh, f first of all, you must realize that working interdisciplinary is, is the worst way to work. It's, it's horrible. It is absolutely horrible. You are constantly being critical at each other and at yourself. There, it feels like you are moving 10 steps back instead of 10 steps forward. But at the end, this is magical product that, has, that would have never been there if you didn't work in an interdisciplinary way. I think maybe it is also because the academics and the museum world has maybe reached out a little bit more towards each other the past eight to five years, um, COVID, COVID in between. Um, more of academic people have found their ways <coughs> in the museum world, uh, like Wayne Modest is now the head of the Tropen Museum, world, the head of the World Museum. Uh, uh, Valika Smulders, uh, she is, is, a, is an academic uh, person who now is the head of my department. So I think, um, it is not only art historians with a PhD uh, that are coming into the museums. It's, it's now almost these PhDs, people with, with an academic background working in, uh, in academia that have now found their ways as head of departments and in, in higher positions than prior. So perhaps you, you, you want to join this discussion as regards to one of your uh, main arguments. Uh, just uh, yeah, uh, jump in, and then the other question would be like for me. Keep in mind, you have a good example of what you call the postdisciplinary uh, museology. Yeah, when you know we um, in, in in thinking uh, along interdisciplinary lines, one also has to pay attention to the to the politics of discipline and to the history of disciplines and why it is that certain disciplines came to take shape in their way, in the ways that they did, and how dif certain disciplines became the means of studying certain societies. Because this isn't just a matter of... <laughs> this isn't just a matter of uh, just... Uh, being comfortably in those disciplines, but sharing and exchanging. It's actually dismantling the, 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 the boundaries of those disciplines and thinking, uh, in, uh, quite frankly, in a post-disciplinary way. Um, and there, there are so many examples of that. Something that I only learned in the last, uh, four, last five, six years that I've been working in Germany and that I didn't realize after working for a number of years in Basel in Switzerland. But, uh, uh, you know, Germany, by and large, did not develop African history as a part of Geschichte. 
because, and there are a number of reasons for that. So, and, and, and one of the chief reasons is that as a society that had lost its colonies, it did not have to face anti-colonial struggles and struggles for freedom in the 1950s and the 1960s that shaped, that reshaped disciplines in certain ways um, uh, in Britain and in France and, and so forth. Um, and so Germany is like a, like a laboratory of a 19th century world of colonial thinking and disciplinary forms. And in Switzerland, there was, there was one example of something that was quite radical. And that was that at the University of Basel, a family foundation appointed the late Patrick Harris, my former teacher, into a professorship of African history in the Department of History. That, for the German-speaking world, is an absolutely radical move. Because in the German-speaking world, you have this discipline which is called Africanistic in the way that disciplines attach themselves to geographies. And Africanistic is the, the, the 19th century combination of Sprachkunde, philology, and, and ethnology that come together and shape how you study African societies, much like Germanistic is philosophy and literature. Um, as if those are the languages that you, that you need to study Germany. So you have these terrible problems of discipline so that you have to engage these questions politically and historically. And you have to do so in ways that recognize the ways they are tainted by colonialism. And that doesn't mean, you know, because a new society, a new democracy like South Africa it has made itself a new nation in, after apartheid, has done so, you, you make yourself a nation through the discipline of history. You don't make yourself free through ethnology. No, no, no. You don't become a free, sovereign person through ethnology. That discipline, in spite of all of its introspection and its changes, mainly in the Anglophone and Francophone worlds, that opportunistically are borrowed in the German-speaking world. You know, you, you, you have to look at those kinds of dynamics. And history is a problematic discipline in its own right. And I'm very pleased that I was trained in what has turned out to be, if you think about it, the most radical uh, uh, sub-discipline of African history, which, quite frankly is an anti-colonial an anti disciplinary initiative that came out of the struggles against colonialism. Um, but of course, it's also potentially nationalist. And so we have to look at all of the, the ways these disciplines work, how authority is wielded, and how arguments are made, and how people continue to be subjugated through the operation of these disciplines. Sorry to take too much time. Um, okay, so maybe we can uh, move to the um, to the next topic. We ah, we would like to. You want to add something? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah I totally please. agree with you when you say that the uh, this is important to take into account the uh, colonial origins of the the social sciences uh, because in fact we we have forgotten that. The, the social sciences, the history, geography, anthropology, obviously, uh, but also law, economics, etc., were institutionalized at the end of the 19th century in a colonial context in Europe. So that's, that's very important. So ju just a word about the, this question of, of uh, transdisciplinarity in the, in the French uh, world, uh, because it seems to me that that one of the main uh, problems in France is the waterproof uh, separation between the academic world and the, the museum world. Because in fact, uh, um, in, in France, we are all part of a very conservative and very corporatist uh, professional circles. You know, in French, the same word, conservateur, designates 
at the same time, the curators and the conservative people. Uh, so uh, in France, Curators are trained in art history and are specialists in, in heritage conservation, but they hardly teach at the university. It's, it's almost impossible to teach at a university where, when you are a curator. And, and the other way around, researchers had very little access to museum. That's very different compared to other countries, even European countries. So this is why nowadays the big museum, uh, the big, the, the, the greatest French museums, uh, develop their own transdisciplinary research center and, and or, or cre even create them. Uh, of course, the Louvre owns uh, a, a great research center, uh, uh, le, le Centre Vivant de Nom, uh, but Orsay is de developing uh, uh, currently a new uh, interdisciplinary uh, research centers. And perhaps you know that this is the, 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 the one of the main subjects uh, the Louvre Abu Dhabi is working on the development of a new uh, research center as well in Abu Dhabi. So uh, um, uh, I consider this cooperation between social sciences and, 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 and also between the social sciences and the curators indispensable and, and most of the time very fruitful for both sides. And I, I just want to show you an example of this kind of very shortly, may I? Yeah. Uh, uh, of this kind of cooperation between uh, uh, diff different disciplines and with curators as well. So this is a research project I developed in, in 2015 with a geographer, a French geographer, Fabrice Argunez. And initially it was a book uh, entitled uh, The World Seen from Asia. And, and uh, it was about Asian cartographic traditions and the different ways they represented the world. So. We proposed first these exhibition projects to two museums in France, they, which refused, in fact, for several reasons, uh, the project. And then Sophie Macariou, the uh, president of the Guimet Museum, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, Asian Art Museum in Paris, uh, National Asian Art Museums, uh, in fact, uh, decided to organize the, uh, this exhibition. And in fact, I, I, I just wanted to, to say a few words about this uh, exhibition because I think this proactive approach, this idea to propose a project to the museums, enabled us to discover collections, to discover new archives. And this is the case in this uh, um, for this exhibition, we discover a lot of ancient Asian maps, hundreds of Japanese, Chinese, Korean maps, uh, which are in fact preserved in the universities' archives, in the libraries, and even in the museums uh, in Europe, not only in the Musée Guimet. And uh, this is uh, an oversight which reveals, in fact, a blind spot in museography and in the history of cartography. And that's why it is very fruitful for the historians, for the geographers, and as well for the curators, because on the one hand, the maps were previously not given their rightful place in museums. Perhaps you know that the maps are traditionally confined to exhibition organized by whom? By libraries, especially national libraries in London, in Paris, etc. So on the other hand, historians, uh, this is one example of historians, um, mostly focused on Western cartography and excluded all the forms of geographical rationalities, Arab cartography, Indian cartography, you know, uh, uh, African cartography, etc. So uh, uh, we had to convince curators that Asian maps are not only knowledge tools and, or, or poor instruments, but also real works of art. Uh, uh, and both aesthetically pleasing and disconcerting to the public, these maps also cause us to question the way we see the world, the way we understand the world. And, and, and uh, just, just a, a word to finish, the other way around, the historians, the geographers, the uh, sociologists should consider a number of seemingly very strange or mythical maps, like in the Chinese or the Korean uh, 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 um, tradition, uh, uh, they can consider these maps 
as true forms or cartographic expressions. So on this condition, the transdisciplinary collaboration could be very fruitful on both sides. I think that speaking, are you finished? Yeah. yeah. So I think that um, speaking about uh, maps uh, can also allow you to speak about uh, what we thought as kind of paradoxical uh, between the difference between the national and, and the global. So when we talk about decolonizing museum, it's uh, really, as you all showed in your uh, intervention until now, about global entanglement, about uh, collaboration, about traveling objects, and so on. And on the same time, uh, of course, museums are usually national institutions and uh, with focus on national and political discourse. So maybe a question, and I would like to hear you about, uh, about this, uh, Ellen, is uh, what uh, are the national specific, specific challenges, and maybe especially in Switzerland, because as you said, as also Thomas and Bernard said uh, in introduction, Switzerland was considered as a non-colonial country, so what are the implications uh, relating this global and, and national uh, paradox? Yeah, I think it, it, we saw it certainly when we started working on, on the Chintz exhibition, um, a, a country with no colonies, no access to the sea, but colonial activities. And we wanted to show this and, and we found it very difficult to just find material culture to actually show what had happened and uh, what it meant, for instance, for a Swiss person to own a plantation in Suriname. And I was very jealous when I went to the Reis Museum and visited the extraordinary uh, slavery exhibition uh, because there were all the objects. We had the bells from the plantations, we had the machetes to cut the sugar cane, we had the big kettle to boil the, the, the sugar, um, the branding iron, and these objects are extraordinarily powerful. And uh, so, you know, I'm sure France and, and Great Britain have these objects as well. When we did the first exhibition in 2018, we borrowed um, objects from Bordeaux, for instance, shackles and bonds, so that we could actually show what it meant to be a slave. But for a permanent exhibition, this was not um, a possibility. So we had to think, how are we going to talk about slaves in an exhibition where we don't have anything to show? And so what we decided to do is to actually show what the slaves, the enslaved people had been used for, which was to grow sugar and cocoa and coffee. So in the exhibition, we decided to just show sugar pots, sugar spoons, um, coffee uh, pots, uh, cocoa pots, because this was being widely consumed in Switzerland. And, and this was a way of going around this problem with material culture. So I think that that's one of the problems in Switzerland. We don't necessarily have the material culture that goes along with our history. That's certainly one of the, one of the points. Pierre, maybe you wanted to add something about this uh, tension yes. between global and transnational. Yes, to, uh, national, to, to answer to, to this question in a very uh, pragmatic or, or prosaic way, uh, for me, a good way to, to work with uh, uh, foreign countries in, in general is to, uh, to enhance, uh, to promote, in fact, the, um, the collections on site. Um, Oh. Yeah, um, let, let's take just the example of this, um, this exhibition. This is a new exhibition uh, which is currently uh, taking place in Singapore. And uh, in fact, we try to um, um, value uh, the uh, very rich local collection, local and, and in fact unknown collections of, um, of Asian maps in Singapore uh, and in the region, uh, especially the, the collections of the, the, royal, the, the royal collection of Thailand, the, the collections in the Japanese universities, uh, for example, Yokohama University, and also the private collection uh, of uh, um, rich Indian tycoon, for instance. Uh, it's a mix of all these collections, regional collections, and, 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 and um, 
unknown collection. So in, in um, 2025, these exhibitions will travel and will be transformed uh, in San Francisco in the uh, Great Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. And to give you just uh, the same example, we will use mostly the fabulous collection of Stanford University and of uh, the, 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 collect, the private collectors of, of, of in California. So uh, it is, it is a, um, um, a very easy way, in fact, to organize the exhibitions, and but also to mobilize researchers on site, academics on, on the spot in California, in Singapore each time, and to organize uh, before the exhibition a series of seminars to, to to, to, to conceive the exhibition. And during the exhibition, it lasts uh, almost six months, during the exhibition, uh, um, conferences, a series of conferences uh, uh, in Singapore, then in San Francisco. You want to add to no, I, I, have, I have two, two questions, but, but maybe, I mean, um, for us, at the, when we were looking at um, finding things on these uh, plantations in Suriname, we also checked the insurance because uh, they sent these artists there to draw uh, these buildings and these plantations and, and, and not for them to keep, but to say as an insurance, this is what I have and how much can I insure this for? So there are archives that maybe you, you might not yet have reached because uh, you haven't thought of that, that they also need that to be insured, which is to make a bridge to your mapping. For me, I, I was wondering, how do you read these maps? Because if I look at these maps, it's, it's maybe still a construction of how Europe sees the world. And when I see these maps, especially from a Dutch perspective, uh, and I, I come from a colleague myself, so I, I read these maps as stating, look at us, this is ours, oh, and this is ours as well, and this is ours as well. So I have this, this, yeah. this so I was just wondering, what, how do you read them for yourself? Yes, yeah, but yeah. It's, it's not at all the case. In fact, the, 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 the Chinese tradition is, mm. is even older than the, 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 European, the European medieval, yes. So, so, so it is from uh, yes from and for yes, yes. exactly ah, you're yes, right you're yes. right because we we integrated the the colonial influences and the European before the colonial influences uh, since the the, uh, the the 16th century Matteo Ricci you know all these stories you know the the the, the European Jesuits in China for instance but this is this is another story which is very interesting, but this is not about traditional uh, uh, Chinese cartography. This yeah, no, no, but, but how do you read them then? How ah, do that's you... why, that's why yeah. we need, yeah. that's why we need... Uh, oh, the, the, oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay, yes, yes, okay, yeah. It is impossible to do with, with, without uh, collaboration uh, in these countries. Yeah. Can I just answer what, uh, concerning the archives? And I think you're, you're perfectly right there, and uh, we also found things, for instance, in our collection, which we hadn't found in 2018 because we were looking with new keywords and looking for other materials. So yeah. I think we always have to go back to our collections because we always find new things. But another point, um, when you come to archives, and I don't know how it is in other countries, but in Switzerland, we still have problems uh, accessing certain archives mm -hmm. because the, the whole chintz manufacturing, chintz... Um, uh, business was private, these archives are still private, or even if they are in public um, hands, the, the access can be um, stopped. So as soon as you say, I'm interested in this family and their links, potential links to slavery, then the access is forbidden. So that's also a big problem. <laughs> Some families have been extremely well documented now, like the Burkhard family in, in Basel, and others are still, we, we don't really know. Because I've been, I've been reading about these Swiss bankers who had all these plantations, but mostly they all ended up back in the Netherlands once they reached a certain wealth. So maybe we should work together to see if we can, maybe they are in the Dutch, they, they could be found, more could be found in the Dutch archives uh, that you could loan in, in that sense. Uh, and, and again, with the VOC, uh, the, the, there were so many Swiss, like I think Beatrice Verassa, 
counted about 2,000 Swiss mercenaries who were employed by the Dutch East India Company. So, you know, we're talking about lots of people here. Yeah, one of the... That's why I'm pleased about the more recent work in the Rijksmuseum, right? because the exhibition that the Rijksmuseum did on South Africa was absolutely terrible. <laughs> in spite of all of the advice that was given, in spite of all of the discussions, they went to the usual suspects and they were hell-bent on reinventing Afrikaners as Dutch and that you have the single unbroken line between Dutchness and Afrikaansness. Um, and that was in the exhibition. And, you know, it, a, a certain kind of concept of Jan van Riebeek um, and in spite of all of the research on the invention of Jan van Riebeek as the Volksplanter in 1652 and so forth, uh, I think the, the Rijksmuseum is now in much better shape. Now, in, not necessarily, but okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I must say that, that the most lessons that we've learned came from this exhibition. We had a tour with South African students and um, I, I, I did not work on this exhibition, uh, but we were floored, floored, killed and murdered. And, uh, and uh, I wrote, we wrote everything down and learned from that experience. So I think also in the Rex Museum, uh, maybe it wasn't a good experience, but for us, uh, it, has, it has made such a difference in that we do things differently now. I just finally wanted to put another issue on the table on this subject of the local and the global, which is very important and how we are always local and global. We are always um, uh, a process of self-interpretation, some more than others. Some have multiple passports, some have an African passport, which makes your mobility incredibly difficult. Uh, I'm, I can only be here because I have a few days left of my Schengen visa. Otherwise, I won't be able to. But we must stop thinking about colonialism in the singular. Because societies are marked by multiple colonialisms and colonialities. And what makes South and Southern Africa peculiar is precisely South Africa as and South African people as former, as the descendants of former colonial subjects, but also as being the descendants of colonial oppressors, in the sense that South Africa had colonial authority over Namibia, and what it takes for a new democratic nation to accept that legacy, which is a legacy of colonialism, segregation, and apartheid, and of war and of violence in the region is an enormous project. Because as you can imagine, South Africa has human remains and artworks, material culture that has to be returned to South Africa. And at the same time, South Africa has to do substantial returns to Namibia as part of that ongoing decolonization. So decolonization is not an overnight event. It is, as some of our students might think it, it is, as we see in front of our very eyes the way that notion has gotten gentrified. So we can decolonize our diet. I can decolonize my clothing. Because these are, these are matters of politics that we, have to, um, that we have to understand. And that is why our colleagues in Basel and uh, I said at the University of the Western Cape, did this project on what we called the South African Empire. Um, would you say two sentences on that project? Because that would be like an example of how you like uh, try to uh, tackle this question of the global, like local, like this simultaneousness of uh, globalism. Yeah, it was, it was wanting to work with all the meanings of empire that it was possi possible to. It kind of slightly predated the decolonial debate, but can be read 
through a kind of uh, uh, a lens of, 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 of decolonization. And what did you do in this project? I mean, is it like an exhibition or a, or a publication? Or... Uh, it's a publication. It's a special issue of the Journal of uh, Southern African Studies that was published in 2015. Um, and it also has set up a, a restitution agenda between South Africa and Namibia that was spearheaded by the late Jeremy Sylvester, passed away last year of COVID. Um, and that is ongoing work and that we are doing today as part of our Action for Restitution to Africa program, working very closely with the Museums Association of Namibia so that we move from an earlier phase of provenience forschung provenance research that was a slightly more enlightened way of doing collections management <laughs> to one that is actually purposefully directed to restitution and that we use that term restitution deliberately and not repatriation. Uh, the, the European curators like the term repatriation because it sets up a process that is merely a geographical move and not, not a contest of sovereignty. Unlike in the United States and Canada, where Native American human remains and material culture is spoken of as sovereignty because of the legal position of so-called reservations. For us, it's very important that we talk restitution so that we build these projects and there are programs, they are not events to be dealt with by events management, as, as happens. And you know, the clearest case of these multiple colonialisms and understanding them simultaneously is the tragedy of Namibia with the interrupted but incomplete German colonialism and how the claims present themselves and how the people of the North are deemed to have been not colonized by the Germans but only later by the South Africans after the, after World War, after the First World War. So it's very important that we understand these, these matters. And equally, I mean, um, you know, it's just so beautiful to talk earlier with Stephanie because I have, you know, as a, a native of Cape Town, I have the ability to speak a Creole Dutch. That, and I can play with it and I can turn it into Netherlands and I can turn it into Flemish, and I can play with it. But there, there is a reason why. And that Dutch colonialism by the VOC, that is not a, just the Dutch that was unbroken, but that was a European colonialism, a mercantile colonialism by a company, by a commercial enterprise, um, as the, the consequences of that Colonialism in the 17th century is playing itself out as we speak on the banks of the Lisbic in Cape Town, where a new development through heritage as mitigation is creating a concrete monstrosity on the land where the original dispossession took place, on the very land where the Khoisan defeated the Almeida in the 15th century and where, and you, you would think that that landscape would be regarded as so important in the history of anti-colonial struggles, but today it is being prepared to be the headquarters of Amazon, Africa. At the moment, a court has halted the development and many of us are rallying around it, but the chances of a victory unfortunately, are very slim, because heritage, erfenis, erbe, heritage is itself a domain of colonialism in the disciplinary moves that it makes, in the governmentality that it brings. And that is a her that heritage as mitigation, which is the mitigation of development, is colonialism, 
reincarnated. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Siraj. And, and uh, I think it's very important, like how your position, because you, you show that the stake of decolonizing museums from a South African perspective is not the same as one from a European perspective or, oops, or you say from a Caribbean perspective is not the same one as from a European or Swiss or white perspective. So, and I think that is one of the main uh, important issues and that brings us to the, the topic uh, you want to address, which is like uh, something you brought up, uh, uh, Stephanie, like the representation for to whom do you speak in the museum? You know, to, who is the audience? Who is the target? Who is not the target group, but actually who's the community? So, um, so that the stake for the mainstream society is a different one than for uh, 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 black and POC uh, communities. So, and um, when we are talking about like, decolonizing museums in Europe, and on folks, it's not the same thing as doing it in South Africa, what you learn. Is, uh, it's always very much about these political relations that you talked about, Tiraj, and the question of like whose memories and whose histories are represented and taken into account to define who the nation is. So that is actually the, the, the state. So uh, I would like to address you on the question of the audience of how. How important is it to work with, with communities and how do we engage the communities? Because, like, to give it another twist also, when we talked about intra and transdisciplinarity, we still talked about a lot of academic, artistic, curatorial knowledge and how important could the knowledge of communities be to, uh, and also to bring in new perspectives? I think in the Netherlands we are at this point. Um beyond just asking communities to come in and have a conversation for them so that we can represent their culture. Um, I think it's not all, um, um, and it has been done for a long time. They would, they would get zero money, just coffee and tea, and there has been a revolution in the Netherlands by the black community stating, no, you are a curator, make me a curator and I'll come do your job. If we can't do your job properly, then, then leave this topic alone. So I think we've now been shifting towards not whose story do we get to represent, but who gets to represent it themselves. So it's um, opening up for more curators of color like me um, that now have the opportunity to get in and say, well, this is not the way I would do it, um, which is extremely interesting because when you look at exhibitions and you would state that we are making an exhibition for children, you would see that no one would think that it would be weird because, you know, you address children differently than adults. But I think when you say, uh, we want to make an exhibition for people of color. It's almost like, no, you can't do that. How are you excluding people? And it's like, no, it's, it's a way you talk and present things that are absolutely differently as it would be with children, as it would be if you have a different skin color. As we all know, um, having a different skin color comes with a different way of how you experience life and how people experience you and how you are treated and how you are met. Um, so, so that's one. Um, and secondly, I hope to finally move away uh, from this whole decolonizing process and get to a place where black people can just be uh, because you are now having the problem that we have artists of color who are just not interested in decolonizing or colonizing or touching upon this subject. They just want to make art. And it's like, nah, that's not interesting enough for us because if we're going to get you in as a black artist, you have to do black stuff. So it's, 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 it's now becoming almost like a, a new way to crush uh, one's culture or because there is no freedom in what you would like to present yourself. There is still this European way of deciding that I decide for you that what is interesting for you at this point in time. So, um, yeah, we're not there yet. It, it feels like it, but it's just a new concept 
uh, to still have power on what is being said, seen, and shown in my but do you, you go further? You know, one thing is like to have a let's say a black curator. You're still a professional. You're an academic, so on. So that's very important. We know it, and it's not that easy to get that far. You know, it's not happening here so easily. Um, and uh, but what is about like different ways of working with communities? And I mean, like really, like uh, yes. associations <laughs> together, yeah. and also really activate the knowledge which is there. Yeah. Because okay. there's so much knowledge in in migrant and black of you know, colored Absolutely. communities which are not, you know, activated because they don't become part of, of uh, public uh, history. And I, I would say like, when it comes to migration, and I'm a migration scholar, you don't have to ask me about Swiss migration. So ask any migrant, you know, best better how migration system works. Yeah. Because they are always in the offices, not getting the permits. They know how it works. Yeah. So how is it possible to have different kind of cur new curatorial strategies of collaboration yeah. where um, this kind of knowledge is more present? I worked, uh, I mean, you must imagine, in, in all the exhibitions that we work at now in the Netherlands, we, we always get um, experts in. So it's not just people from the community, but pe uh, experts that have the ability to tell us as curators much more than we could tell them. Um, in Black and Reverend Slime, I remember um, it was my first exhibition and I, I, I wasn't really sure that I could really use this sociological point of view because I was still maybe impressed by this art historical way of showing and exhibiting exhibitions. And we um, uh, got uh, people from, um, from the black community in and this one woman said to me, this is so horrible that I will not take my son to this exhibition because what you've done is presented in a way that is art historically, which therefore it is an extremely European way of not looking at myself, what you would like to bring to me, but I'm looking at the way of how they brought us to them. So it was this, this one point that I thought I was, I was doing so great and it turned out I was, you know, it was just not working out. So we immediately changed the whole structure of the, of the exhibition. We, we took away from art historical way of telling things and, and we started, in, instead of looking at this depiction of black people in that 17th century, we started to realize that we could look at the presence of these people and, and how, to, how to make their, their presence be felt in that room uh, instead of how these artists, who were white men, uh, painted them technically exquisitely. So um, if I didn't have them, I think it would have flopped because I was thinking that I wanted to make this exhibition for people like me, but I was doing exactly the same. That, that was, yeah, interesting because like, I can only share like one experience of like a small intervention we did in a museum where we were like all already collaborating and collecting for uh, uh, I talk people uh, and it, well, there were like uh, racist uh, depictions, but there was already collaboration, how could it be uh, discussed and framed and so on. And one of the interventions was that we said, we want to do like a tour, our own tour in this uh, exhibition, which was like connected to, we want to be there as a community and only then with music, with our own music, and only then perhaps the representation can be changed. But it has to be done because the exhibition was already so strong, the building was so strong and powerful, it was only like in this very fragile moment of being there as a community, there was a possibility to change the, the meaning and the ownership. And that is actually actually exactly that what I was thinking about. And in this sense, the question to you, Helen, as a, as a like director of Lambs Museum, you know, who is I'm, your... I'm the director of Chateau de Pongin. Okay. The director of the London Museum here, yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but still like of a part of the London Museum yeah. of Curate. So, who do you address as an audience? And um, I also think about that because you said we try to uh, depict like the Swiss people being abroad. Whereas, for example, Stephanie in the Rembrandt uh, exhibition you showed, oh no, we want to show the black people as a, as a, as a proud, uh, pride, proud people. 
So who is your audience and, and what are the challenges that you face? Well, I think we, when we do an exhibition, we always try to think about which our audience are we going to target at the beginning when we start working. Um, so, you know, for instance, we've done exhibitions really for schools or school children. But in the case of the Chintz exhibition, there was no particular community in, in, in mind. It was, we wanted to target um, the large public, the wide audience, um, and make sure that whoever came into that exhibition would understand what we were saying. So also being very careful on um, you know, the terminology, trying to avoid jargon, or if there was a word that really we had to use, then explaining it, just to make sure that what we're trying to tell here, which is complex and, and difficult and, and not easy, not straightforward, can be understood by anyone. And, and then I think um, we really saw how um, we were surprised how um, for many of our visitors, um, it was t a total discovery, this chapter of Swiss history. Yeah. Really, people said, we didn't know, we didn't know. And, and they kept on saying, but are you sure that we really did this as well? And, and, and what about that? Are you sure that there were really Swiss textiles in the ships going in? And, and this helped us immensely because we then used all this um, backfeed from the public in the second permanent exhibition, which we did. We really saw where were the, uh, um, the questions coming from the public, what, what did they need to know, what were, and, and we tried to adapt. And I think that was really um, extremely positive. Can I just add a, a quick question? Uh, do you uh, um, do you face? Did you face many uh, resistance? Was it just surprise, or was it also I don't know denial or resistance, or maybe some you know really strong reactions? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think we had strong negative reactions of people saying I don't believe this. Um, we had reactions sometimes of people who thought we hadn't gone far enough. People who perhaps came from activist groups or so who thought we just hadn't gone far enough. Uh, but it was mainly surprise, but also an immense interest. And, and it's, it's strange because it's extremely well known. I mean, the historians have researched this so well. We really used all the books that have been mentioned today by Donna David and, and others. And, and we just tried to restitute this in our exhibition. But then we saw that there is a gap between what people do at the university and until it reaches the, the, the public. And I think that's basically what I feel our job at the museum is, is to relay um, part of that. I have another question, perhaps a critical question or perspective. And I, I saw the Indian Andean or experienced the Andean exhibition in Zurich and I loved it. It was really great. Um, still, could you imagine to, uh, still I felt it was like a, a dress, like the, the main, like the main, like the public, the pub, public as, as if there weren't any kind of uh, intersectional hierarchies or like exclusions who gets access. No, it was like a very, like a kind of a neutral kind of object, if that's how it was. And uh, could you imagine to say, like a kind of, like we want to enlighten, we want to bring new information to the debate and what, what it did in a, in a very nice way. But could you imagine also to say, we want to do an exhibition which uh, represents and empowers minorities of color with migrant background. Could that be something which is uh, possible? like in the strategy of the, the, the Chateau Prange or the, the, something that Stephanie like was a, a alluding to. Is this possible to, 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 to do this kind of, so follow not, this kind of, because it has, a diff, it has an yeah. effect on the representation and the curation? Perhaps just uh, to mention the exhibition that you saw in Zurich is not the one that I did in Prange, and it's not the one that is now being, it's, so it is different. And perhaps for the one in, which is now on show in Prange, which is permanent, um, for instance, we, we worked together with a, a, a historian based in Rio de Janeiro who works with oral history and, and who has really spent years now trying to make um, much better known the heritage of 
slavery in Rio de Janeiro, which is totally uh, suppressed. No one wants to see it. And, and this is something that comes on show in our exhibition. But to answer your question, I think we ha we did not, that's the one step we did not make. And I think when we had um, people from activist backgrounds come to us, they, I think that was one of the things they would have liked to see, where we would have actually worked with perhaps local communities and given them part of um, co-curating or something like that. We did not do that. What we did is work with people in Dakar, work with Brazil. We did. Now, I think that's a, a, an open question for the whole Swiss National Museum. And I think also with the new definition of museums, which has been debated right now um, on a world <laughs> scale, uh, which will be voted hopefully uh, in the summer. I mean, all these questions are going to hit us hard. <laughs> Um, you know, these, these issues are playing themselves out in different countries, in different ways, in different settings, and they are erupting through different exhibitions and uh, projects. One such project was the um, Oceania exhibition that uh, took place in London a few years ago, which I was not able to go to because I, did, I didn't have a UK visa at the time. Um, but some of you will know the book Curatopia that has come out of that and that makes a case out of the museum making exhibition production and the curatorship out of the Pacific on, makes a case for what it calls co-curatorship and even makes an argument that it's in advance of restitution. And quite frankly, which is uh, a neo-colonial museum methodology. Um, today, if you go to Bremen, to the Ubersee Museum, there is a, a young, utterly interesting uh, Samoan uh, young scholar who is literally defined in the museum as the co-curator. So who gets to be curator? and who gets to be co-curator. The very interesting, uh, very interesting issue. And obviously, I mean, the, 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 I mean, ICOM has tail-ended this discussion on what we mean by museum. The new museum has been in operation already. It's not happening in English. It's happening in Portuguese and in Spanish. It happens in Latin America. It happens through what the colleagues there call social museology. It happens in the, social, in the program on social museology of IBRAM, of the Brazilian Museums Association, uh, of the work of uh, Museo de Marais in Rio de Janeiro. It happens through the Eco Museo de Amazonia. There are a number of different examples of, of how publics are not demographics to be consulted as one of the steps that you have to take to make a more enlightened exhibition. But where you conjoin your museum practice and publics, in which your practice has embedded inside of a concept of publics, and in, to, to that end, we have such important examples of museum failures. There is the, there is the example from the mid-1980s in Toronto, the Into the Heart of Africa exhibition, which many of you will know, which wanted to be a deconstructing exhibition of colonialism, but which the... Uh, the, the um, the people of African origin in Canada found to be incredibly violent. There was, there's the South African exhibition that took place in 1996 at the National Gallery. Miscast, a famous exhibition about a museum failure, about a curator with absolutely no sense of who this exhibition was directed at. To my shame, I'm the only black uh, contributed to the catalogue. Uh, I put my hand up 
for that. Uh, but we had a very interesting example of this difficulty just three weeks ago in Berlin uh, on a museum visit with 15 graduate students from University of Western Cape and 25 graduate students from the Universities of Cologne and the University of Bremen. And all of you will have followed the powerful work of Berlin Postcolonial, activists who started off pressurizing the German government to apologize, to own up to what was a genocide, and to work towards the restitution of human remains. It didn't really have a concept of museum, but that came slowly. And Berlin Postcolonial Post have participated in the creation of an exhibition in the museum Trepto about the uh, exhibition, the great exhibition that took place in that part of Berlin, where colonial subjects were put on display. And what they tried to do is to recover the dignity of each individual person from portrait photographs that began as physical anthropology images. And they, they went about colorizing the photographs as a, as a strategy of finding subjecthood and finding dignity and humanity. Our students found that to be a very violent exhibition. And the, the colleagues from, the, from Berlin Postcolonial were absolutely distraught that they might have caused the harm through. And the final example happened the, the following night when these activists, playwrights, theater people put on show a lecture music performance about black people in Europe and flashed up on the screen the racist images that you will know so well of Sarah Bartman and doing so as their strategy of claiming a biography and a history. And my God, it was so violent in a reproduction of that colonial violence. So these are very difficult questions and they're no easy answers. It is make the mistake, make the mistake again, work again and work again. But we have to get to a point where we understand that the museum and publics and communities are not separate entities. That we are, when we remake the museum, it has to be a museum that is a, a space of interrogation, of inquiry, and not just conversation, but of disagreement. And we have to find ways of exhibiting disagreement. I, I think it's a very nice way to, to end up the first part of the, of the session. And maybe speaking about uh, audience, uh, we would like to give the opportunity to the public to ask questions. So just, you can ask questions in English if possible, but if you prefer to ask them in French, it's also possible. Just raise your hand and we will give you the microphone. Yes. Uh, maybe we take two or three questions, and if you have someone specific you want to ask the question, you just. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question for Helen. Uh, my name is Denet. I'm a multidisciplinary artist from Sri Lanka. So my question actually it's about um, you were talking about this exhibition with about slave, slaves. So um, for me it's interesting as a museum when you organize this kind of exhibition. What is your view or how you plan to transform this this very difficult um, subject to children? For example, uh, in my early years in Paris, as an artist, I worked um, um, in an after school, uh, looking after doing art with children. So I have come across some children, they saw previously a movie, and they are playing like, oh, you're my slave, and they are playing for a, for a joke. So uh, I was shocked. Uh, so for example, museum exhibitions are open for public. It's not only for adults. So they will come with the family, children. So how, 
as a museum, you, you plan this kind of very fragile, very, mean, very difficult subject, transform it to the children. Uh, for example, there's an exhibition coming in uh, Amsterdam in the museum. It's all about the dof. Uh, they were exhibiting different dof from different countries. I think it's going to be this year or next year. So this also subject, how as children, they will see this exhibition and how they, would they laugh or would they see at the dof in their day-to-day -day life and how they would react. So how museums will, will work on this, how they will organize this kind of exhibition for children as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, in the case of our exhibition, um, when we targeted the audience at the beginning, when we were thinking, who is this exhibition going to aim, we decided that it was not going to aim the young audience um, for various reasons. And, and one of them was the, certainly the, the complicated um, aspect of the content and also the fact that we have quite a small space in which we deal with lots of um, rather complicated content. So for this, in this case, we did not uh, set up anything special for children. Then just perhaps, I don't think that um, when families come in the exhibition, there is anything that would be shocking. Uh, it, we are not showing things where you would, no, that's not true. There are one or two things that could be shocking, but not many. But yeah, no, we haven't addressed, in this case, we have not done anything specific for the young public. So the question remains, how would we do it? And, and because the exhibition is, is it's an exhibition on the history of chins, it's not an exhibition on the history of slavery, even if that part is obviously dealt uh, with it. But yeah, we haven't, we haven't done anything special for the children. That's something we could do, yeah, yeah. 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 We get one shot. Ok, euh, merci beaucoup pour euh, toutes vos interventions qui étaient super intéressantes. Euh, la discussion était vraiment riche. Moi, je voulais aussi revenir sur la question des archives euh, en Suisse, étant donné que c'est le topic qui m'intéresse. Euh, Enfin, après vous avoir écouté, je me demandais s'il fallait vraiment euh, aller à l'étranger, par exemple en France, pour, euh, bah, je sais pas, emprunter, emprunter des archives euh, pour euh, parler de l'histoire coloniale suisse, et s'il n'y avait pas déjà assez, justement, euh, d'archives euh, qui dorment, que ce soit dans des musées, des... Des, 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 enfin, toutes sortes d'institutions en fait, qui ne sont peut-être pas culturelles. Enfin, Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas justement un, un plein d'archives euh, déjà présents pour parler de ces histoires-là Et je me demandais aussi s'il fallait aussi bah, repasser par des, euh, euh, des, 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 des signes qui sont hyper, euh, c'est vrai, hyper forts comme ça, comme euh, les chaînes d'esclaves pour parler de l'histoire coloniale suisse. Enfin, euh, ou de, de l'histoire, enfin, du lien entre la Suisse et l'esclavage. Euh, je ne sais pas si j'ai été claire, mais voilà. Je vais faire une très rapide translation pour ceux qui ne parlent pas français. Donc, la question était, je pense que c'est pour Hélène et Stéphanie, peut-être, ce qui était sur les archives. Donc, est-ce que nous devons vraiment aller dans les pays foreign pour travailler sur la relation entre la Suisse et le colonialisme Ou est-ce qu'il y a suffisamment d'archives under exploited archives in Switzerland. And the second question uh, was more about, do we need to show, uh, when we speak about slavery, do we really need to show these images, images of enslaved people? Is that correct? Yes, because I feel like um, Switzerland, it's not special, but has its own way to do, to deal with colonialism or slavery. So I was, I was asking myself after listening to you if we really need to go abroad to borrow all the, those signs to talk about Swiss colonialism or um, we can focus on what we have here to talk about that history. 
Yeah, th thank you very much. Well, I'll start with the second question. That's precisely what we did. We decided not to go um, and borrow things from abroad yeah. and just focus on what we had. And, and our collection is full of these um, sugar bowls and things like that. And we thought, well, that's a, a good way of, of showing because, you know, sugar being consumed in Switzerland in the 18th century, we know very well well where it was being made and how it how it came. And and for your first question, the archives, I, I, I can't really answer that question. I, I just know that we had problems with accessing certain archives directly related to the history of chins. And, and that I know a lot of other historians have had this problem. But I, I would be fairly confident that you can find material to work on uh, in Switzerland, uh, it also related to the Chintz history, and notably, for instance, to all the Glaris production in the 19th century, there are extraordinary archives in the canton of Glaris, which I think are totally underestimated, uh, and where you have, you know, whole cupboards full and, and there's a lot of work still to be done there. So that would be one, certainly one field where one could work. Um, can I just say something about the archives, uh, about slavery and so on? Um, 15 years ago, when we go to Neuchâtel in order to get access to a private phone, which is in the public uh, archives, I said in order to get access, because we had to uh, um, have the, the authorization of family that I want not. Some people said, don't say that you want to look at the history of slave trade and Switzerland, because you will never get access. <laughs> but so I didn't lie. I said I wanted to look at the relation between Switzerland, Africa, and America, which is in one case, it's the, you know, <laughs> I didn't lie. And so I get access, I, it was difficult, but the person who was in charge was very nice at that point and so on, and I couldn't make any photos and so on, but I was able to, you know, we were able to, to write five pages, to write five pages on, you know, the, one of the famous uh, person in Neuchâtel who owned slave, you know, a plantation and had slave and so on. And after, but, I know that all the person I know, I think that they close their, their archives and I'm not sure if it's possible to get access to them. And I know that, you know, in the newspaper, some person related to the archives said that I lie in order to get access to the archives. So some says, you know, there is a banking secrecy, secrecy very important in Switzerland. There is also a very important archive secrecy and it's, you know, you don't have access to the archives of the banks. You don't have ac access to the archives. And perhaps Bernard could explain you, but I think one strategy is to go abroad, you know? And we were able to look at, and Buddha Eteman was able to explain the history of the participation of Switzerland's slave trade in going to, in France and so on, and to get access because here the, the archives were more open. But it's a very, very difficult and complicated. And because I lied, it seems that no, nobody can access to these archives, which are wonderful. And this is really a pity. I think, I mean, um, one could also put too much attention on archives. So, um, um, for example, at the Rex Museum, um, we were supposed to uh, make this exhibition from a person's perspective. So the Dutch have archived everything. I mean, to hearing what you have to deal with, the, the government makes them digitalize everything. You don't even have to touch the paper anymore. You just, you know? So um, they've made machines that read 17th century handwriting so that it translates it for you while you're looking at it at the expense of your own home. Um, I found uh, information on Dutch Brazil of these enslaved people who were on the Portuguese side moving towards the Dutch side and they would write down everything that they had done before because the Dutch were still scared that they would be spies. So I had this story of this person and I thought, oh my God, I found of, of information of an enslaved person and had to really break up the idea of, no, 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 wait, this is a... <laughs> uh, uh, paper written by a white man standing at a post, thinking that this person might be a spy, asking 
questions, writing down answers the way he would want. So this, this is, there's also this, you have to be so incredibly critical of everything that you have and even the archives that you see, what am I actually looking at? So there's still this layer of onion to get off before you finally can say, okay, this is what I've just read, which is, so there's not, it gives more information, but it does only that. It's, it's um, in a museum context, it's all, in my opinion, it's almost impossible. Unless you are honest and critical about the data that you are using. So I can say, yes, uh, this is an archival piece with all that information and then I can tell you what is written on it. But if I start thinking that this archival piece is a story of an enslaved man in Dutch Brazil, then I start reading that paper or understanding what I'm reading on that paper incorrectly. So I think it's in between the lines when you can start to tell this story, but you have to be honest on what you are looking at first. Yes, uh, thank you very much for, for this input. It was really um, very inspiring. And uh, I would like to take up on this idea of the, the archives in Switzerland. And I was um, Im impressed by, by the Musée de Branche, uh, your presentation on, on, and this question of this immateriality. Of the which, which reality, sorry? The immateriality. Immateriality. Immat <laughs> or that, that there are no things. <laughs> Uh, to show, which, which which led me, which I, I linked to this idea, of what kind of terms do we use? Is it post-colonial, really? Or because this um, uh, links me to the, to the question, how do we understand Switzerland today and Switzerland's role in the global economy? And, and the major feature of it is that the things never come here like the Russian oil at the moment, which is to 80% 80% traded in Switzerland, but we never see it. Or, or the, the, the central role of Switzerland in the gold trade with apartheid South Africa, which was a totally immaterial thing, and, and it's so <coughs> essential for a Swiss person like me to understand my own country, to have a grasp of this immaterial, uh, economy that we have here and that pays our taxes, that pays our schools. So I, 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 I thought actually that the work you do in, in searching uh, for ways to exhibit something that has no things, mm -hmm. that has no material uh, trace here in the archives is a very, very pertinent and politically important work. Thank you. I would like to add something to that because in the case of twins, it's doubly um, important because first of all, um, Switzerland was producing twins um, when it was prohibited in France. And at the same time, the main uh, débouché for this chance was France. So everything went illegally to France and probably some stayed in, in Switzerland, but not that much. So we have really a problem when we do an exhibition on chintz in Switzerland because there's not that much to show. So again, what we did is we went through archives and showed you know, all the history of manufacturers, etc. You have views of manufacturers, you have portraits of these, you don't have the textiles, but what do we have? So we try to show that. But another thing is very important is that um, actually the textiles that we do show in our exhibition do not at all reflect the economic reality. And that's also something that we try to say, we couldn't, we say it in guided tours or so, because what has survived is not what was sent to Africa. And, and that was the major bulk of what was being produced, certainly in Nantes, and we have lots of textiles from Nantes. What has survived is what then went into houses in France or perhaps Switzerland. So 
everything is biased and, and the material culture we have does not really allow us to say the story we would like to say or it says a biased story. So we have to be extraordinarily careful when we use it. But thank you for your, your comment. I, can, I would like to say something about the archive. One thing, uh, and the question is like historians, what is the proof that you can find in the archive and the source? I think that's not how politics of history can work only. Like critical work on the resource is always also creative work. And it's also, it's always also speculation. So there is never only a kind of uh, you subsume. So, and that's why I think guys like Spiva or Sadia Hartman, when they talk about like, uh, okay, you cannot find things in the archive, doesn't mean that they're not there. But uh, I think they're artistic, like there are artists here, like artistic kind of uh, population uh, or speculation can be a way to uh, access these archives, which are like in the materialities, in the bodies, in the imagination. And that's where, and I think that it's a, a delicate boundary where history or gets also into uh, mythology, you know. So somehow it is also about fabulation and uh, I think uh, especially the community work can be important to bring these kind of oral traditions or embodied traditions. And uh, it's not about to find the truth of history in the past only, it's also happening in the present. But, you know, the I think you're absolutely correct, and uh, sometimes we we think about the archive empirically, and what what is obviously needed in Switzerland is an activist politics of archives that is able to develop the pressure from because if that if that you know that is going to swing this matter. It's not the scholars. It's not the you know, okay, it could be new, it could be archival policy, it could be because there there is you know just like with the decolonial debate in on the question of enslavement and slave societies and slave economies, there is, has been a forensic turn. You know, if you look at the, 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 the what is happening with the research of the Compensation Commission, and you look at what is happening at certain universities in the United States, you are able to do to some extent a, 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 an accounting and a calculation of which families benefited by how much and what does it mean. And so you have the University of Glasgow paying reparations to, uh, to the University of the West Indies. Uh, and so reparations is also on the table. But reparations is not equally just financial payouts. We need to be talking about reparatory work that has to happen. Uh, but as colleagues were talking about how you, what you show, how because it, it's not just about recovery of voices. Because often those voices that are supposedly recovered are often the illustrations produced by the scholars. And you have a further silencing of the people whose voices are supposedly recovered. The interesting question about South Africa is why did South Africa not develop a museum about apartheid in the sense of these documentation centers in Germany? And there is a debate, yes, between yesterday and today, where the German government has announced a documentation center about violence in Europe, but the activists are demanding a documentation center about colonialism. Because these documentation centers do certain kinds of forensic museum work. Um, and South Africa didn't get a museum about apartheid in that sense, in that sense, ap apart from the one that was created by the, the murderous Kroc brothers called the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg, which some of you might have visited. But an apartheid museum about violence. Uh, why? Because museums in new societies are meant to be uplifting. They're meant to provide. So our national narrative 
provides a, narr- a story of, of struggle that gave way to overcoming the struggle and victory and the triumph of the human spirit. And along the way, we have missed out on the detail of the violence. Okay, it came out through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the records. It's come out in the, in, in the work of the Missing Persons Task Team. But everyday violence, the everyday violence of apartheid has not been depicted in South African museums. And that is an enormous flaw. And it's the same question of how do you do a slavery exhibition? How do you make a museum about slavery that will not be seen to be a project to perpetuate humiliation, but that will be a project that that wants to do something that mobilizes in the present? And those are those are huge challenges that 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 we all have. Yes. Uh, so, thank you. Um, no, I've, I've sort of lost the trail of my thoughts because I was thinking about this uh, about 15 minutes ago. But um, just a few things. Uh, one about uh, the archive. I'm, I'm a historian, so um, I've been sort of uh, thinking about the colonial archive for a, for a long, long time. And, and uh, um, I think it's, it, it's very important that uh, Swiss... Uh, researchers uh, look into uh, other archives. I mean, archives that are, uh, you know, trans-imperial, because precisely because of the presence of of uh, of the Swiss, you know, in uh, in all these other, uh, you know, c- colonial uh, sort of um, uh, interventions. And and just to give you an example. Uh, and Bernard uh, Scher has, of course, uh, is of course much more of an expert than than me. But um, I also work on the 19th century uh, and uh, so the British colonial uh, period. Now, very few people would know that there's actually a Swiss uh, general who, who was actually governor of uh, of uh, Sri Lanka for about a year. I mean, it's it's, it's quite an achievement. I mean, this is, this is something that. Uh, very few uh, Swiss people would know, and that and, and he, his army, the General de Meuron, um, was um, part, of course, for the the Dutch, and then after that they switched and they worked for the the British. But um, I mean, this is quite a quite an important intervention, and uh, you would I I doubt you finding this in the in the Swiss archive. You definitely find it at the British Library. Uh, at the BL uh, in the factory records, uh, so uh, so I mean this is just just an example, but I think there must be so much more that you could you could find about Swiss uh, intervention and entanglement with different forms of colonialism. Uh, and then the, just a minor point. I mean I, th- I think it's a minor point, but it's also a major point. I think when we are speaking about decolonization, I would really like us to also I mean not only look at um, slavery uh, because the, uh, and that, that's often, a, I find a strategy that is, that is taken by uh, former colonial powers to avoid speaking about the lasting effects of colonialism and uh, the, um, uh, the issue also of reparations that do not involve uh, slavery. I mean, there's a huge amount of destruction, we all know, that was caused by uh, colonialism and that, that is not in a, in a way connected to slavery. So, so let's, let's also talk about decolonizing, you know, other forms of uh, domination. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, uh, intervention. And I think uh, it, it kind of opens the conclusion of this session and we, as we are... Running, running a little bit late. I would like to give you the final uh, word. So maybe you can also, with your final conclusion, uh, uh, answer to the last uh, intervention. And maybe more generally uh, speaking, let us know uh, what is your uh, vision of the future uh, of a museum? What are the plans for the future? So not only about uh, 
what are the problems, but also what would be the solution in, in the near future. So maybe I can give you each uh, the, the word and maybe not too, lo too, too long answer. And I will start with, uh, with Pierre. Thank you. Uh, I think th this conversation was very interesting, but I think we met a problem when we talk about colonial. What is colonial? What is non -col What is not colonial? Uh, you know, what is the, the what is in fact wh when you ask the question about the community, what is the link between this community and the object uh, exhibited, in, you know, in the museum? I don't know. Is it is it is it neo-colonial to think that perhaps because I I don't know what is the link. You have to explain me. You know, that's the question for the so-called community, for us, for the museums. So that's complicated. Even, even the, the question of the, um, the painting black people uh, during the early modern era. I, 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 I had a just simple one question, which is the, uh, uh, we know that uh, there were diplomats, there were merchants, there were soldiers. So what is colonial in it? And what is the part of non-colonial in these representations? So that's, that's also a question for us. So my, 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 perhaps my, my conclusion will be just on the necessity, but it's just a word because we will talk about that tomorrow, I think. Uh, I think that we need to uh, rethink the, this notion of, 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 of uh, the colonial, what is colonial, colonial situation, imperial situation as well. And we need also uh, to de-Westernize our way of, of, of conceiving and of using the great categories of historical uh, thinking and understanding. I mean, the question of historicity, you know, uh, uh, we, we follow, of course, the, the, the pattern of the European, the Western historicity, but we have to, 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 to work on the Chinese one the West African one, the, the et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is the same question with the question of sp speciality, the, the, sp the, the, the territories, the, the et cetera. So I think the last uh, uh, pioneer front for us is the question precisely of the museography. I think that there are alternative museographies and the, the museum of the future will work on this. What, 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 what does it mean, alternative museography? That, that is, the museum was not a Western invention. I mean, I mean the, 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 the temple in Thailand, the palace in India, the, uh, I don't know, the uh, caste patrimonial uh, uh, in Cameroon was a form, very different, but a form of museum. And we have to work on this. That's all for today. <laughs> Thank you. Stephanie, maybe you want to um, continue? Yes, I will try to keep it extremely short, but um, and also give an answer because that's the type of person I am uh, <laughs> on, on, <laughs> on your question. Um, so to, to be, uh, I think the museum of the future has to be nuanced and has to be self-critical. Um, and asked to ask questions and also, just like you did, work beyond just objects or finding new ways of telling a story without the objects that you would want or in first hand have. And on, on, a, on an answer to your question of how is it non, non uh, how is it colonial or non-colonial, I searched for this short period in time in the 17th century between 1620 and 1660, where artists actually drew and painted men and people from life and therefore looked at black people and realized that all the other images that I am presented with as a black person is a construct of what the white man wanted me to be as a stereotypical character caricature as being not even real. So you must imagine that looking back in the, in the past and realizing that I have 40 years to look at real people that are staring back at me and all the other 
eros are perceptions or construct of dehumanizing what once before was, to me, it was the first time I realized I could deconstruct by using paintings or tell the story. I could deconstruct the way that something has been constructed. I can show you how that process has taken place. And I can leave it up to you to think if you want to deconstruct that image for yourself or not. Maybe not colonial or non-colonial. I, I didn't think about colonies, colonial itself. I thought, I want to deconstruct the way black people perceive themselves. Yeah. And Elena, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, that you were also uh, anxious that this all this discussion wouldn't be just a, a trend, but also yeah. th that it, it goes on a structural change. So maybe you want to add something to this? Yeah, I think it's very important that um, it becomes a long-term strategy and uh, we're not going to solve any problems just by every now and then doing one exhibition on a particular theme. Um, so I think that that really has to become a, a process and I think museums have to reimagine the ways in which they work with and and, and um, especially with whom they work and what they value and I'll, someone mentioned that the the word of expert you know who do we consider are going to be experts when it comes to cataloging items when it comes to curating an exhibition when it comes to um, looking at our collection perhaps even when it comes to deciding what comes into the collection. And I think there we have a, an awful uh, lot still to do. And um, the last point, I think we, I would also think that decolonization is not only about race, but it's also about gender, about sexuality, um, and also about class. And, and, and there again, museums have a lot of catching up to do. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's. Uh, a pity that we don't have much time to discuss this point because I think it's a really, really important one. Um, Siraj, please, I'll give you the last, uh, the last word. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, I, I have referred to the new museologies that have emerged in local community museums, projects that are often connected to each other through international alliances and that have really been putting the pressure on UNESCO and ICOM that led to the UNESCO uh, recommendations, new recommendations on museums that began in a meeting in uh, Rio de Janeiro in 2012 and that culminated in um, a, a statement uh, out of Shenzhen in 2017. Uh, the ICOM debate tail ends that uh, because these are new practices already. And what is needed now for those ideas, for that idea of what we increasingly call the museum as process rather than the museum as building or display or collection, to be brought to bear upon the restitution debate so that we begin to understand the possibility that this moment that we are living through of activism on the African continent and activism in Europe, meeting, collaborating, and creating these pressures are at the same time pointing to the museum of the future. And one of the points that I've been trying to make is that restitution potentially points to a new museology. That restitution is not an event, but it opens up a series of projects and activities that I think can be enormously fruitful for us. Thank you very much to all of you for all this very um, stimulating uh, thought and insight. Um, Hoy, do you want to add something? No. So I guess I will maybe give the floor just for the very final word to Bernard or Thomas. I, have, I want to add something small. Please, big applause uh, for our, uh, because we do a lot of work on science.